Okay, so here we go. Um, welcome to the show, Dr. Shakuntala Nair. Uh, how should I address you? Shaku is fine. I go by Shaku. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, nice yeah. to see you. So you have a PhD in entomology and then you have a Master of Plant Protection and Pest Management and uh, and so on. The list is endless. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. You've been a teacher, you've been a research fellow, mm -hmm. and uh, right now you are uh, uh, having an outreach program for uh, the students, I think, right? On how, how integrated pest management. Yeah. So it's, um, well, part of my uh, function is outreach. It's okay. extension. Okay. Extension and outreach. That is the, you know, the more... Uh, correct term, I would say. Okay. So, um, and it's not always with children. Actually, I mostly I deal with adults. Oh, <laughs> I children, see. Although I would have loved it the other way around. <laughs> yeah. You know, children are so much better. <laughs> oh, true. Very true. Uh, yes. The brains are fresh. They'll Very absorb. receptive. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But uh, even with adults, you know, uh, you can tailor your messages in a way that they can accept it and retain it and apply it in their lives. Right. So, so, what's the difference between extension and outreach? What what exactly is the difference? Um, outreach is, uh, I, I would say, it was, it's simplifying, really simplifying your message. Okay. Uh, that um, and take the the actual only the essence of what you need to tell the public. Okay. And give it to them in the simplest form they can understand. Okay. And apply it. Whereas extension, all of extension is actually. Tran the transfer of re research results uh -huh. that happens in the lab okay. in universities and other organizations, uh -huh. transferring it to the public, all of that is extension. Okay. So it can be done in different ways. Different ways, yeah. yeah. Uh, that I would think is a pinnacle, right? Because, you know, it's yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, the ability to be able to break down complex things to in simplified terms is, I think, the most difficult part of... Uh, the whole uh, uh, very very challenging isn't it very challenging yeah. because you got to use words and terms that people understand right and right. That, and not not just words and terms you can use you, you sometimes need to use pictures you need to use right. props and right, you know, right different things so it's very interesting actually it is you know uh, yeah uh, to prepare myself to be able to talk with you today i did some amount of work into uh, you know what uh, what entomology is all about and uh -huh. what, what is uh, called about uh, what is known as integrated pest management mm -hmm. it used to be pest eradication from there it seems to have moved to pest management right mm -hmm. that's uh, correct yeah so uh, <clears throat> apparently it's it's uh, it's pest management and it's it's not actually eradication because er eradication would mean throwing the baby with the bathwater right because <laughs> killing everything that is, that is correct and it's not required it's yes. not possible. It's simply yeah. not possible right. normal, in the normal conditions. Yeah. Right. In this complete <laughs> web of life, if you disturb one species, mm -hmm. it gets uh, correct. Can, everything else is it's a it's a domino effect, isn't it? Right. Yeah. There's so yes. many far-reaching effects that we are not aware of at this point, but yeah, you know, who knows what is going to happen? I know, <laughs> especially since uh, insects form the majority of uh, life forms on. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. Most so, diverse. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little about uh, the pest, uh, the pest control that right. we talk about. No, it's okay. That shows you're a busy person. And thanks for the time. <laughs> okay. So uh, there is this usage of uh, organic pesticides like neem. So uh, I'm not quite sure how effective that is. What do you uh, is it a, is it an effective pesticide and does it have a very kind of a broad spectrum kind of killing where like beneficial insects are also killed? Actually, um, neem the uh, the active ingredients in neem are very 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 potent. They have a lot of potential, and uh -huh. uh, at lower concentrations, they generally function as repellents or deterrents. Okay. They repel or prevent insects from feeding on okay. a surface that on which these pro, this, this uh, material is applied. Okay. But at higher concentrations, they can actually kill also. Okay. 
so it really depends on the concentration at which it is applied <coughs> excuse me and yes both the beneficials can be harmed also <coughs> beneficials and uh, insects because they're all insects ultimately right, right. so uh, the 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 poison is in the dose it's always okay. the case okay yeah. okay so uh now when you say it's a deterrent <clears throat> i'm also having a bad throat i'm sorry oh, about that sorry so the uh you say it's a deterrent deterrent how is it by just a bitter taste or is it by the uh, is it by the smell uh it's by the bitter the alkaloids in in the oh the, yeah that's what causes the deterrent action so sorry <coughs> yeah. water <laughs> no i'm good okay. it's just the morning yeah i know thing. Yeah, you're probably three hours away from I am, but I'm also having still the the morning throat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So uh, now, how do uh, how do insects learn and transmit this learning to other insects? Like, like if I taste something bitter, I can tell my family, for example, hey, this is not good. This is bitter. So how yeah. does how does information get transmitted between uh, insects? How do they? Know? Yeah. Great, excellent question. You know, uh, many um, insects are social insects, uh, like you know, honeybees, right. ants, and right. uh, so the species, like so social species, they have ways of communicating between species of the same individual. They use pheromones. They use chemicals called pheromones. Okay. That uh, uh, you know, they have, there are there are different types of pheromones uh -huh. that are used for specific purposes, mm. and. Um, that is one way of communicating that insects use hmm. and uh, some other species have uh, different you know movements like you know bees have dances have you heard yeah, of that they, yes, yeah, that they, yeah. so uh, they communicate yeah that's how different ways that they communicate in is really amazing so hmm. they have uh, mostly but mostly it's uh, because of uh, pheromones that they and volatiles that they release into the atmosphere that gives clues to other other individuals of the same species and tells them that look that is not a good good idea don't go there <laughs> so, okay so okay. even though they cannot uh, communicate like in words like we do right uh, or sometimes there might be little uh, sounds that they make little trills and you know buzzes and things uh -huh. like that that tell them that it's not a good idea to go there but mostly it's the pher pheromones Okay. They're very, very um, released in very minute quantities, but that's enough for the insects to sense what goes on. Yeah. Okay. I wish we also had this thing. So, I know. It's not so easy to pick up a phone or on social media and shout at another person. If you had to do a dance, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. yeah. There is this theory that a healthy soil uh, gives rise to uh, insect-resistant plants. Is that true? Well, that is a very good point and you know um, the basis for it's one of the founding uh, principles of uh, pest management for at least for crops where plants are concerned uh. to have a healthy plant you know it's innately resistant to it and it, it can tolerate a lot of insect damage hmm. so and the basis for healthy plants is of course healthy soil right hmm. so if there's um, adequate uh, nutrition, water, you know, in places like Arizona, water is crucial That's right. for the life of a plant. And it, you can overwater and underwater. They're both stressful right. Right. for plants. So uh, a, a plant that is stressed is naturally prone, more susceptible to mm. insect attack. Mm. Uh, because it's trying to, it's, uh, it's trying to you know, devote its energies to sustain itself rather than resist. Um, when a plant is stressed, it's trying right. to uh, devote its energies to sustain itself rather than resist pest attack, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, There's yeah. a lot of uh, chemical changes that happen when a plant is stressed and insects can sense it. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So um, when a plant is stressed, uh, when an insect comes and chews on it, it gives out a certain set of volatiles and hmm. it tells others, other uh, species, that mm. uh, hey this plant is stressed you know this is easy target come here wow so yes definitely when a plant is healthy though uh. it can you know it has all that energy that it can uh. devote 
to fighting of insects, not only insects, even other pests like pathogens, for example. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, and nematodes in the soil. Okay. Right. Yeah, earthworm so stuff. You mean? Gives off all of those signals saying that, yeah, uh, don't touch me. Don't, <laughs> you know. Don't mess with me. <laughs> don't mess with me. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you know, while reading this, there was another interesting thing that I also, um, uh, you know, I don't know if it was a video or something that I saw. It says that plants that are stressed have a higher level of antioxidants in them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should learn to tolerate imperfection. So if you buy spinach and you find a few holes, probably that's healthier than the ones that is perfect. Is that right? Right. In in some ways, you know, plants react in, in different ways. Different okay. species of plants react in different ways. So in some cases, it's true that, uh, you know, when their plant is stressed, they, they will produce an uh, extra antioxidants. Hmm. And uh, if that's what we are interested in, then yeah. Okay. But sometimes, you know, those antioxidants make the plant bitter or uh, they make the leaves tougher, which is not, which may not be exactly what we're looking for as food. Okay. But uh, eventually it helps the, the plant, you know, it's trying its best to protect itself right yeah and that's what results in those uh, you know abnormal productions of antioxidants or extra fiber mm. you know, things like that so it's not just purely cosmetic but you say that uh, that the leaf can also get tougher if there is yeah a... ab yeah absolutely can yeah, get that... tougher that is one way of uh, plant resistance against insects or be worried okay uh, oh. yeah. Plants are not as passive as you think they would be. Oh, no. A lot of They're things. full of life. <laughs> so then comes the question, I mean, people who talk about uh, not eating non-vegetarian food because they're killing an animal, I suppose that <laughs> plucking a leaf is equally disastrous to a plant, I'm guessing. Yeah, you have to think twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So there is this thing that you, when we talked about healthy soil, now, um, when they put in uh, fertilizers, like say, for example, urea and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, there is a theory that these nitrates uh, that go into in excess of the plant, uh, the plant actually starts calling insects to get the nitrate out of its system. Is that right? Uh, so um, that is one theory that, uh, you know, when there's too much of uh, something available, uh -huh. then, uh, yeah, the plant will it doesn't exactly call out, but, uh, you, you know, in a way it's true. Yeah. So that's the signal given saying that, you know, that all of that luxuriant vegetative growth, uh. Uh, you know, it doesn't need it all, but the plant has no other way but to put out that growth because of, you know, the way it's built. Mm. Right? Mm. So um, in that way, you could say that it's calling out and <laughs> saying, <laughs> telling insects, please come and get, you know, get some of this. Uh. Um, but so yeah, it's all in those those chemical signals that that the plant is putting out. Okay. And it yeah, it could be a way. Uh, if you that's interesting though that thought that the plant is actually calling out. Yeah. To come and get some of this away from me. Yes. I don't need it. Yeah, it's like something like you you have a thorn stuck in your flesh and you ask your uh, friend to come and pull it out for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. That, I would think that as a kind of a battle in, in purely layman terms, not going anywhere near uh, your scientific brain, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's purely layman talk. Yeah, and that it's the same for grazing animals too. When there's a lot of vegetative growth, uh, it, the plant is very attractive to animals that graze on, on the leaves, right, on the vegetative content. Right. And um, when there's excessive, excessive nitrogen, the plant generally does not uh, tend to flower. Hmm. Right? produces a lot of green matter. Hmm. That's interesting. So the other uh, thing was this pest management, uh, the use of predator insects. So insects that feed on, uh, you know, the harmful things. So there are good insects and bad insects. Right. I mean, bad insects in our point of view, all insects are great. <laughs> Uh, the, the ones that feed, <laughs> the ones that feed on, uh, you know, the plants that uh, like a nice juicy lettuce leaf, you mm -hmm. find insects uh, devouring it. Right. You want right. somebody to uh, take get rid of that insect. So, how far is that theory? Uh, does is it a workable theory? You mean the use of beneficial insects like yeah. predators? And absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you know, if you go to any uh, home garden, hmm. where, you know, that grows vegetables or ornamentals. 
Uh, there is a certain pop, you know, population of beneficiaries there, but not everyone is aware of it. Hmm. So if you look carefully, you'll find lady beetle larvae hmm. uh, and lady beetles, you know, the little hemispherical little beetles. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, you'll find green lace wings, those very hmm. dainty looking pale green. Have you seen them? I've seen lace wings. Yeah, the lace uh, ones, yes. Yeah, and uh, many other praying mantises. Uh, yeah, so there's so many um, pred- natural, naturally occurring predators and uh, parasites, uh, those are a little more difficult to locate. Uh-huh. Uh, they're mostly wasps, you know, teeny tiny little wasps that lay eggs on many of these pest insects like caterpillars. Okay. Some okay. lay eggs on aphids, some lay eggs on aphids, so you can imagine how tiny they are. Uh-huh. Right? Okay. So um, a lot of those uh, these pest insects are controlled by these uh, naturally occurring predators and parasites. Uh, but sometimes the pest insects are so numerous. Uh, um, I don't know if you've noticed an aphid infestation. Yes, I have. A, I have. have or, okay, on peas, on a yeah. pea plant, uh-huh. it covers the entire stem. Sometimes the entire plant is covered with aphids, and right. in such cases, you might. You know, the predators alone, predators and parasites alone are not sufficient. And that's when you have to intervene and, you know, use some other kind kind of method mm. to bring down the populations a little bit. Mm. But um, a lot of people don't realize that the, the valuable service that these uh, beneficial insects provide. Right. And when we go spraying all over the plants and, uh, you know, on your ornamentals, you're killing a lot of the beneficials also. Right. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. And in some cases you can get to buy uh, these beneficial insects too. Mm-hmm. So there's, a, there's companies that mass produce beneficial insects and mm-hmm. uh, you, you can buy, you know, they sell them. Mm-hmm. So you can buy green lace wings, for example, mm-hmm. you, you buy the larvae or mm-hmm. the eggs. Mm-hmm. You can buy lady beetles and, and their larvae. And mm-hmm different predators and you can release them in the environment then they'll take care of the pest management pest management for you <laughs> so it is very much possible and sometimes in certain certain conditions like for example organic greenhouse production sometimes uh. that's the only method that is allowable uh. Uh, you know uh, so you and it's a controlled environment so you can you know exactly what goes on inside and you can use uh, beneficials only to control but when it's a you know larger scale production, mm-hmm. sometimes predators and naturally occurring predators and parasites alone may not be sufficient. Mm-hmm. Which and that's when you have to bring in other methods. But they are a very very important part of uh, pest management, biological control. It's mm-hmm. called biological control. Yeah. Oh, biological control. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, also, I just wanted to add. There's also pathogens, insect pathogens. Like uh-huh. there's fungi that, that attack insects. There's bacteria oh, specifically. specifically. Oh, yeah. So wow. those are great tools too. Those are great tools to have in uh, your uh, pest management toolbox. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, also there's this uh, intercrops, right? When you use uh, symbiotic kind of, um, a, 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 if you want to protect a plant, you put another hardy or plant next to it so that right. Insects go to that rather than go to the the crop, the crop, crop of our interest. Yeah. yeah. But this will not work if it's for acres and acres of uh, monocultural crops, right? Right. It's like difficult. Maize, for example, when you have a huge ten acre lot of how do you how do you tackle that? Is it just aerial spraying or uh uh-huh. so there are different so like I mentioned earlier, there's a pest management toolbox, right? Right. right. And um there's not one toolbox that's suited for every situation, sure. every uh, farm or every home. Mm. Uh, and so it really depends on what the grower or the farmer is interested in. Mm. So if there's a 10 acre lot of uh, soybean, for example, in mm. the US, that's a common crop or cotton mm-hmm. or corn, uh-huh. any of that. Mm. So it depends on whether the farmer is interested in, in you know, putting rows of uh, intercrops in between his corn hmm. it's it's their choice what is more profitable to him okay. uh, so they can take that decision that, and certainly you can uh, you know plant rows of uh, other crops in between hmm. if uh, that is something they can manage hmm. 
Mm. But if not, then uh, they'll have to probably use um, uh, um, you know, mass spraying of insecticides. Uh, mm. there, and even in insecticides, there are safer choices. You know, right now, there are a lot of newer chemistries mm. that can be applied at certain times. They can be applied in, at certain points in the soil, for example, rather than spraying or, you know, in the air. Mm-hmm. So there's different ways of applying pesticides to mm. minimize the risk. Mm. Uh, you know, aerial spraying uh, may not be um, required, really. Okay. But, uh, you know, use of uh, sprayers, you know, low volume sprayers mm. that deliver the pesticide as really fine uh, droplets and very precisely. Those are some of the better options that I would suggest. So you would think that uh, adding pesticides as a drip irrigation, would that? That is also an option. Yes, definitely. Okay. So about your question about the intercrops, you know, sometimes it, that's what I said. It may not be feasible all the time to have intercrops, although they are a great uh, option. Mm. So if uh, the farmer cannot have intercrops, then he'll probably have to go for other options like uh, spraying or he could use resistant varieties. That's another great, uh, you know, tool in the toolbox. Uh, you could, he could use cultural methods like... Um, for example, certain uh, certain pests pupate in the soil okay. at certain times, right? So if there is an intercultural operation that takes place at a certain time uh-huh. in the in the crop cycle, that will uh-huh. you know till the soil and you know in all of the interspaces and and kill a lot of those pupae or okay. expose them. So cultural okay. uh, control is also a very important tool in the pest management toolbox. Mm. So there's all these different things that uh, farmers or growers can do. Mm. They could use uh, traps, like sticky traps, sticky cards. Yeah, I heard about that, pheromone uh, sticky traps. Pheromone, yeah. There's pheromone traps too, great point you brought up. So there's all of these other options that they can do instead of uh, relying on spraying alone. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, with they this... Can, uh, with this the demand for uh, organic uh, mm-hmm. produce, it's uh, going putting a whole lot of insecticides or uh, urea. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. You said about uh, uh, you. You talked about resistant uh, crops. Mm-hmm. Resistant crops. So is that would that fall under the purview of GMO or no? There are some uh, crops that are engineered to have those resistant genes in them. But if you think about it, uh, you know, resistant plants have been around since, you know, as long as we can remember, really. Some are naturally engineered, right? Yeah, by process of... Uh, natural selection. Yeah, no, some, no, it's natural selection. Right. Uh, there's mutations that happen and some plants are just naturally resistant to certain pests and diseases. Some are engineered also. Okay. Yeah. So is that bad? Is that engineered... Uh, produce uh, uh, you know i don't think they are bad because it's not something that we developed recently it's been happening if we did not have uh, genetically engineered crops yeah. we wouldn't be here today ah. i mean how would the, the population survive with um, uh, unless there was a green revolution using you know better varieties of crops right oh. yeah uh, so, natural- yeah so it doesn't uh, I don't think it makes sense to, you know, criticize that the entire effort of having uh, GMOs and, uh, you know, in breeding resist insect resistant crops. Mm. I mean, they have a certain purpose, but uh, there's also this uh, practice of having um, islands in between. So if you have a whole, like a 10 acre farm of uh, insect resistant crops, mm. you need, um, and none of the pests will survive on that, right? Technically. Yeah. yeah. So what would the natural enemies feed on if there are no pests? Right. So the, the recommendation when you're using those kinds of crops is to have, uh, you know, strips of um, non-resistant, like susceptible crops. Okay. As so a that, far- yes. Yeah. As a fodder. So when, when people follow those recommendations and have a, a good balance, uh. then uh, I think it's fine to have those kinds of crops. Why not? It saves the farmer or the grower a lot of money, a lot of effort, which can be used elsewhere in mm. a better way. Mm. So uh, I wouldn't 
you know completely rule out that you know i'm not completely against that it really depends on the situation and uh, there are a lot of benefits to them mm. to using uh, genetically engineered crops mm. because some of these uh, buzzword marketing buzzwords are no added uh, corn sugar and no gmo uh, every single right thing. yeah or oh, looking for those labels actually so you yeah. it's good to know from you that it's not all of them are bad no yeah they're not okay and it's not all, they're not all like i said they're not all uh, created by using you know genetic uh, mod using like um, certain harmful rays uh, i don't know what uh, people are you know people have different they don't have a clear idea and that's why they're scared they're worried you know and and it's true that uh, not all of those crops have been tested for generations on people really? to realize their effects what is going to happen yeah but if you think about it some of our uh, wheat varieties for example they have uh, been around for cent centuries and we are doing fine with them uh, if you know if you think of the ancestor of uh, you know the cultivated wheat uh, uh, we, there would not be anything to uh, for us to eat right if you think if that was still grown right so that is also a result of uh, genetic modification if you think of it that way uh, so uh, uh, i would say i i'm not uh, you know i would suggest to approach it a little in a little more scientific way you know get a little more information about what exactly that the what exactly has happened to that crop and mm. then arrive at uh, decisions is mm. what i feel yeah i i wish this was uh, this was made available in terms of information to the masses because you know it's mm -hmm. just labeling completely all gmos are bad as uh, as you explain yeah. it's it's not it's not the case and right. that you also very rightly say that people were died by now because of no food they absolutely i mean people just don't think that far out and see what would have happened if we had those traditional varieties uh, you've heard of triticale right that was the ancestor of our cultivated wheat oh, it is very very low yield potential uh -huh. and, and the grains i don't think they are you know very edible either So uh -huh. we still had varieties like that, you know. Right. We would be in real trouble. <laughs> yeah, I still vaguely remember about uh, hearing uh, this uh, IR eight or something in uh, uh -huh. rice, right? In, in the in in the uh, right. revolution, I think uh, Dr. M. Swaminathan was uh -huh. uh, was responsible for that. Yeah. In revolution, so it would have been great for you to have been uh, associated with that. with ms with ms right yeah i had the fortune of working in, in the uh, with the foundation for a little bit when i was yeah. in india yeah but uh, i have met him but uh, um, i have worked with uh, one of his uh, one of the professors at the at the institute at that time dr s jayraj okay he was an entomologist and uh, he was an excellent researcher very well known yeah good. i had the good fortune yeah <laughs> right <laughs> so uh the other uh, uh nice little trivia that i uh, discovered was these lace bugs i believe uh set out uh, sweet secretions that attract ants that keep away the ladybugs wow <laughs> isn't that amazing i mean if you look at that in you know the entire you know how would say community of insects yeah and the ways that they communicate with each other <laughs> it's just amazing it's mind boggling really right yeah i mean this the, the the dance of life one would say mm -hmm. literally how right. how interdependent uh, i yeah. think i think the humans are the aberration <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and it's absolutely true not just for lace bugs but many other sucking pests uh -huh. you know like um if you think of it aphids are are sucking pests too hmm. i don't know how familiar you are with the different uh, feeding methods of insects you know there's some that suck, suck yeah i know sap, I, right? if it's if it's and uh, lace bugs are su are sucking yes it. Yeah. and whereas you know other insects for example beetles and grasshoppers or uh, ca and caterpillars which are the young ones of butterflies hmm. they all have chewing mouth buds so they chomp I, on the directly on the plant right but these others uh, that have sucking mouth but they suck out the sap mm. and very often they suck out too much sap 
and they they just don't need it like we talked about <laughs> the plants earlier they have they produce so much that they don't they don't really need it right so insects do that too they just get rid of uh, what they don't need and uh, that's really concentrated you know uh, and it's rich in sugar and it's called honeydew excuse me uh, yeah. yeah it's called honeydew it's sweet right. right and so that attracts a lot of uh, other insects that like the sweet uh, substance and ants are a great example Hmm. and um some in some cases the ants tend to these uh, saps uh, sucking hmm. insects and hmm. maintain them protect them from their predators hmm. so that they can have a steady supply of uh, sugar you know right. and um another uh, you know creature organism that grows on the sugary substance is sooty mold uh-huh. so sooty because it's sweet and especially if it's hot and humid hmm. you'll find uh, a black fungus growing on the uh so all the surfaces sometimes all of the surfaces the lower leaves sometimes it drips to the ground when there's a heavy infestation of aphids or other sucking pests the, mm. the honeydew is so much it produces produced in such large quantities mm. it drips to the ground and you get a layer of sooty mold the fungus that grows on this the sugary substance ah. so so it's not only the uh, conversation that goes on within the species it's across right. species also across across species absolutely yeah uh, uh, we being able to communicate with uh, a dog for example it be able to understand that I right mean, so then comes the question who's more advanced <laughs> i know i really wonder right it's <laughs> amazing these little creatures and the ways they they communicate um i don't know if you've heard uh, you know there's so many other types of uh, communication for example um we're talking about uh, we talked about predators and parasites right i told you about the little wasps so there's, there's some wasps that they lay eggs on the caterpillars uh-huh. on caterpillars and the the young ones develop inside the caterpillar uh-huh. and the caterpillar is uh, the, ca- the the wasps actually secrete along with the eggs they secrete chemicals into the caterpillar which is the host mm-hmm. that modify its thinking this is serious stuff okay it's it modifies its the caterpillar's thinking uh it doesn't kill it but you know kinds of slows it down so that the caterpillar just stays there it eats you know enough so that it can sustain the wasp larvae that are developing inside it and the caterpillar actually wards of other predators that lay that come to lay eggs on the same caterpillar so it kinds of uh, kind of you know uh it devotes its life to protecting these uh larvae that grow inside it oh. and yeah so it can modify the thinking too sometimes these predators so this it's so advanced you wouldn't believe it yeah almost like uh... they are the aliens <laughs> right and yeah it's unbelievable and uh, so the caterpillar t- t- typically when the caterpillar is ready to pupate right huh? you know if you look at the life cycle yeah, so yeah. typically it spins a cocoon around itself yeah. depending yeah. on the species right but in this case the caterpillar doesn't spin a cocoon around itself but it will spin a co- you know a layer of uh, silk around those uh, developing uh, wasp oh. mm-hmm. pupate to protect uh-huh. it and then finally it will die so there's uh, things like that happening i'll i'll show a share a video with you oh, after be, this <laughs> you be, might be interested to see yeah yeah I mean, it's crazy it's mind blowing <laughs> yeah it is really and all with just i think just a singular uh, focus is to preserve the species right mm-hmm. yeah the wasp needs its uh, species that is right This, yeah wow every step it will you know takes every step possible to ensure that its offspring have survived yeah it's really amazing <laughs> anything else you'd like to share any such similar uh, some uh i recently i got a forwarded uh, you know message on whatsapp um it, the, it showed a, a wasp that was dragging a dead uh, grasshopper i believe it was yeah it was dragging a grasshopper and uh, uh you know very very uh, 
carefully it, it dragged the grasshopper just you know several times larger than it Correct. in terms of Correct. size it yeah. dragged it and dragged and dragged and made, you know ultimately reached a hole it pushed the grasshopper inside and you know covered the uh, hole with uh, earth mm -hmm. and uh, the commentary on the whatsapp video was that you know insects sometimes practice burial Ah. <laughs> but uh, it, it was interesting the commentary was interesting ah. but in truth you know it was actually the this is another brutal story okay it's not a very <laughs> uh, uh, it's not a happy story but i just want to share it it's saying you know just say uh, how uh, you know how advanced and how deep the thinking is in nature ah. Ah. so what had, had actually happened is that the wasp had Uh, stung the grasshopper and paralyzed it. Uh -huh. She dragged it to her her nest uh -huh. and laid laid her eggs on the grasshopper and covered it. Covered uh -huh. the nest. It's a, it's a hole in the ground which she covered. Mm. And then she the grasshopper would would lie there. Uh, the wasp larvae would emerge mm. and feed on the paralyzed grasshopper, mm. which would uh, which would last. You know the her sting has the power to preserve the grasshopper. from decay mm. so that it will last as long as her larvae need and then the larvae would develop inside the grasshopper and eventually they would emerge wow. so yeah that would be it was really interesting to see the video and uh, and the commentary and uh, someone sent it to me and asked is it true that insects practice burial uh, and i said no it's not uh, it's not a burial but yeah this is what is happening there so <laughs> it's very very interesting right. and and i one more thing i want to share is you know i mentioned gr green lace wings remember correct yes so green lace wing eggs um, mm. and green lace wings are present everywhere you know they are uh, present worldwide mm. and uh, if you ever have you know seen green lace wing eggs no oh okay i love talking about this i love telling about this to uh, people who have not heard it okay so typically insects lay eggs on on a surface right they right. either scatter them yeah. or they lay them in masses right uh -huh. sometimes they covered with some sort of silk or something sometimes they just egg masses mm -hmm. green lace wing eggs are laid on stalks okay uh -huh. each egg has a little stalk uh -huh. and they're so beautiful to look at uh -huh. okay and uh they laid in a cluster so there's a little cluster of uh, stalks and, and and there's an egg on top of each of them uh -huh. and the reason they lay it la that way is that green lace wing larvae are voracious predators okay, okay? and if they lay and they even feed on each other they're cannibalistic oh, they okay. even feed on each other okay so uh, that's nature's way to prevent cannibalism from happening at that point when they just hatch Uh, so it gives time for each of the larvae to hatch and descend uh, down the stalk and disperse because if they were laid in a mass uh, you know they would eat each other and we would get just one <laughs> <laughs> so uh, isn't that fascinating i mean absolutely how how do they think of this you know it's just so fascinating and green lace you can buy green lace wing uh, larvae you can buy them as eggs also Uh -huh. And uh, if you buy green lace wing eggs, you will see that each of them is in you know separated. Mm. It comes in a little cardboard uh, uh, structure uh -huh. in compartments, and uh -huh. even if the if the larvae or eggs, they are all separated. And this is the reason why oh. they are all set together. They would eat each other, and we would mm. get just one. <laughs> if you order fifty or hundred, we we'll probably get yeah. one. <laughs> the strongest one. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So green lace wings are great predators, and they can, you know, I've I've bought green lace wings for my uh, research project. They arrived uh, in uh, these little fascinating uh, containers that have little, you know, walls in between those separations. Uh, and in each of them, you have one larvae. I found that fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So this is not. Uh, uh, it's it's probably. not an individual intelligence right it's hard uh, it's hard coded it's uh, yes yes yeah it is wired into them into wired into those little brains they know exactly what to do right it's yeah yeah it's so so fascinating it's uh, i mean is it 
I'm, I'm speechless. I, I, it's, it's, it, that's the problem theory that there is something called God that exists. <laughs> you know, uh, I, when I teach about uh, predators and beneficial insects, um, uh, I've often heard people say that, you know, I have to believe in evolution because God could never be so cruel. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, and I show people, sometimes I show people videos of paras insect parasitization. Right. Right. You know how was flake on a caterpillar and the cat, you know, the yeah. larvae develop inside it. And that's when I get that coming. I have to believe in evolution because God could never do something cruel. so cruel. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, all in the game, I guess, in nature. Yeah. You know, I once got a question from a lady, uh, you know, she said, she sent me a bunch of pictures of uh, spiders. I get, I get uh, insect ID questions all the time. And I love it. I love doing it. It's one of my favorite parts of my job. Mm -hmm. And she was wor worried that, uh, you know, the spider, there are two, sp there were two spiders and they're preying on each other. Mm. And I don't know, really, there's no need for you to worry, you know, <laughs> about it. It's all part of nature. And she, so she was trying to separate them. Oh, okay. Preying okay. on each other or whatever. Okay. Is it after normally? Uh, is it after mating or something? This happens. Uh, uh, no. Uh, no, they were two different uh, different species. Oh, species. Two different spiders, and that happens sometimes. They oh. can prey on each other. Oh. And um, yeah, sometimes there are. There's also a misconception that some spider species prey like the female eats the male after mating, but it's not a rule even for the black widow. Oh, you know, there's the, the spider oh. called the black widow. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard that myth that the black widow will immediately <laughs> male after mating? Yeah. But it's not a rule. Um, it's actually uh, if he hangs out long enough after mating, you know, within her reach and she's probably starving, she'll probably catch him and eat him. But it's not always the case. Uh, she, hmm. if she can, you know, get so that's away. Not, that's not a hardwired behavior. No, no, okay. it's not. Yeah, but it does happen sometimes. Uh, <laughs> That's another question I get. <laughs> it's <a> true. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think you should start a Ask Shaku column or something. Sir. Oh, I would love that. That'd be great. I get questions. I get questions from um, you know all over the world. Actually, I get still get questions from India. I get questions from India, which I love answering, uh, uh, and uh, a lot from within the US. Uh, I do different part, different states actually. I'm part of um, an Ask the Expert uh, system. Um, ah. We have an uh, yeah an online portal for extension. People can send their questions uh, to uh, the extension cooperative extension in their state, and they're ah. all connected. All of the states' extension systems are connected. Ah. So the a particular state. Uh, there are no experts at that particular time that have seen that question or they don't have time to answer it. It gets forwarded. Oh. So I get a lot of questions like that to okay. identify. I would love for you to share that uh, link the, with me. Sure, absolutely. It's called Ask the Expert and I'll, I'll share it with you. I'll share yeah, that. Send it to me. I'll put it up. Send questions. And, yeah. you know, and some, some people send pictures, some just write out a little paragraph and Asked right. about it, yeah. Right, because <laughs> these days I think this is the science is the only certainty. Because sure. Because so much of noise, mm -hmm. and yeah. cross current going around, <clears throat> uh, one doesn't know what's true and what's not, what's untrue. Right. For right. example, even the black widow thing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was uh, just like what you said. I, it was it was in my head that this happens in. Yeah, it's well, it's not a rule. It, it can happen, but it's yeah. not a rule. As you explained, it's not a hardwired behavior. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, the questions will never run out, and I know never a dull moment with uh, entomology. Really, yeah. there's so much to talk about, and yeah, it's just so many different insects. <laughs> And even after all this, you, I see that you have the time to be able to sing. Ah, yeah, I love singing. Yeah. I mean, you're, it's not a surprise because, you know, you're, you're, your bloodline is that. Yeah. yeah, I'm very, very fortunate Yeah, that uh, way. I saw two of your songs. One was that... Oh, you uh, did? Yeah, that Man Manyani 
That's a difficult song. <laughs> yeah, a very, very old song. Yeah, it's a very beautiful song by uh, S. Janaki, right? S. Janaki, yeah. yeah a, and you sang it so beautifully. Oh, thank it you. Was, uh, you and your husband sang that Kadiganam uh, Neeram, right? Uh-huh. And also I saw. You did. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, well, so, thanks so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Nan Chetan, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Uh, it was such a pleasure talking to you. Like really. Me. Likewise. And one of your uh, Ask the Expert questions will, I, I'm sure I'll have at least two every week. So. Oh, absolutely. Bring it, bring them on. <laughs> so. I don't know if I answered all of all of your questions, uh, you know, to your satisfaction. I mean, I tend to ramble. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I mean, I, I, you, you, you did. And, uh, you know, uh, I was, I, I did, in the process, I've, I've learned a few things. So, you know, I was happy about that. Yeah. So that's how my yeah. I keep my uh, the, the old brain ticking. <laughs> it's, I believe the brain is like another muscle. Yeah. Right? You keep exercising it. Right. You have to exercise it. Yeah. And, yeah. that- <laughs> and uh, you know, one more thought that I want to share about pest management is um, people always ask ask me when they hear I'm an entomologist, they'll ask me, "How do I get rid of this bug?" Hmm. You know. Not not everyone uh, thinks that insects are cool, and you know, very very few people think that. Right. Most people are just interested of getting rid of <laughs> get rid of, getting rid of the insects. But yeah. That's my message in saying that only there's you know there's about um, uh, two or three percent of insects that are actually pests. All of the others are either beneficial or harmless. They don't want to have anything to do with us, really. They just want to mind their own business. Yeah. <laughs> Only 3% are pests. Right. And even that we can manage. Right. We can easily manage them without uh, any uh, too, much eff- too much effort. If we keep, for example, homes, people ask me about pests in their homes. Mm. And, you know, the monthly pesticide sprays, many people, at least in the US, it's a thing to mm. have your pesticide service provider come in every month and spray. Mm. Mm. It is really unnecessary. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you keep your house clean and if you, you know, take out the trash regularly and you keep your food covered, yeah, you can really manage a lot of those pests. There are there are situations where you really have to get external help or use pesticides, but right. for the most part, people tend to use a lot of pesticides in homes. Mm. It's really harmful. Yeah, not knowing it. It gets into your body too, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it lies there, you know, you get exposed to it. If there's little children in the house, you know, they get exposed to it. And yeah. it's, you think you're making your house clean, but uh, that's not the case. Right, right. So I just want to share that, send, you know, send that thought out, share that thought with everyone who's listening. So please, you can easily manage pests without pesticides. There are not anti pesticides, but you know, they're, they're a great tool to have in your pest management toolbox. But there's so many other things you can do. Sure. I mean, the pest, pest. the pest has to come inside your house. That means it, there are <laughs> more food inside your house than outside. Right. Right. <laughs> Basically, right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that's my, basically, that's the message I like to give. That oh. Not all insects are bad. <laughs> right. And also, I think the insect load has been coming down steadily. Oh, yeah. There is certainly an, uh, a reduction, a huge reduction. There's yeah. all these staggering figures saying that we'll be out of insects by uh, 2050. You know, uh, they'll have reduced a lot, which is quite scary. But yeah, if they think COVID is a bad thing, wait till this happens. Right. That right. is true. Pollinators, you know, yeah, and we talk about pollinators. There's all these crazy, staggering figures saying that what will happen if all of the pollinators die? Are we going to, you know, we are going to die of starvation? Yeah. Which is not true. I mean, if you think of it, uh, all of our staple crops like rice or wheat, and they're not insect pollinated. Okay? They're wind pollinated. Right. 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 But what so about fruits like apple? We won't die, but uh, everything that adds value to our food. Everything that adds beauty, color, hmm. fragrance, hmm. sweetness, all of that depends on pollinators. Right. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
So thank you once it's, again. Yeah, thank you again. It's been such a pleasure. I I really enjoyed it so much. Yeah, me too. Me too. Likewise. <laughs> and. Uh,